Hi, Joe Glavin with City Floor Supply, uh, obviously on Facebook Live. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit um, about moisture content, specifically the tools used to measure that. So that would be uh, relative humidity and moisture content and temperature. Um, you know, we're in an industry where we have a natural product like wood and that wood is hygroscopic meaning it's going to let moisture off uh, take moisture on and let it go and it's antistropic which means it's going to grow in a certain dimension um, so and it's going to grow uh, with the growth ring so let's go over that well you know we'll go over that in a minute so what I have are bunch of tools to measure all of that stuff I just said. Um, moisture meters. Moisture meters are, there are typically two types. Um, there is pinless and the pin type. And pinless uses an electromagnetic field and the pins use uh, conductive current between the two pins to measure the moisture content in the space between those two pins. Um, a pinless meter usually has a large magnetic field that it uses to sense moisture in the wood, uh, typically three quarters of an inch thick to actually some of them go up to two inches. Um, the pin meters will also do that. Uh, we have on almost all of our actually not on almost on all of our wood trucks they carry uh, this kit um, in this kit we have our moisture meter our hygrometer and an electrode pin setup that goes deeper than what these 3 8 pins go um, we also have, it's not in here right now, we also have pinless, which is this unit, and that does the electromagnetic field, uh, particularly in areas on, say, a pre-finished uh, job site where you don't want to use pins to damage the floor, and again, we'll get into that discussion as well. So, you can see, just having this kit and having it in every truck, it's, it's important. You know, moisture content, particularly in the mid-Atlantic where we are here at City Floor Supply, um, we can have very, very, very low relative humidity and cold, which means the heat's on, uh, and we can have very high relative humidity, which means 98% relative humidity and 99 degrees. So we have very big extremes here. Those big extremes really affect wood. Um, and not just wood flooring, just wood in general. It goes for moldings, tables, furniture, anything uh, made of wood. Again, we go to those two terms, right? Anastropic and hydroscopic. And wood moves. It takes moisture on and it lets it go. So we need to measure that. And wood has a happy point. And I'm just kind of pulling numbers out here, but it's right around between 30% and 50% relative humidity is kind of where wood is pretty happy and there's numbers to kind of back that all up um, and there's things like equilibrium moisture content so again we will get into a lot of that uh, feel free to ask questions as we go along here we do have a question yep. what is the cost of this kit uh, th actually this kit is not for sale um, okay. this is just something that we put together for our delivery trucks so that the drivers can do measurements. And it, what it does is it gives us a basis of where the wood was when we dropped it off. And if there's ever an issue, you know, like January and February, when the heat's been on for several months and things start moving and the humidity is very low, at least we have a starting point. And every customer that gets wood has that on their file. So. Um, but the, again, the reason we're showing all of this is that these are tools that you should have in your truck. Um, there's just, there's no doubt about it. You should have a, a moisture meter, whether that's pinless or pin, and you should have a hygrometer um, that measures. And 
even a hygrometer that's not this style unit, um, you know, I'll just go ahead and start unboxing. It could be, you know, a unit that this is a Wagner unit. Um, this is a thermo hygrometer. And most thermo hygrometers of this type or this type that have the bulb in them, um, those units can run anywhere from, you know, $75 up to $300. $40 uh, but almost all of them will measure relative humidity and temperature and and that's important because when we measure temperature and we measure relative humidity we're able to calculate what we call um, equilibrium moisture content and again we'll get into that uh, and why that's important but a thermo hygrometer simply set it down um, you know I could turn this one on just want to make sure that the batteries are correct and what we're displaying is a temperature and this one does like a real field temperature it does several different readings but really what's important in our discussion is relative humidity and temperature so we can see it's close to 72 degrees in the shop I am literally right underneath the heater here um, and we're in our uh, repair facility and Angelo likes to be warm <laughs> so we have um, temperature 72 and I'm just gonna throttle the mode here and go to past dew point and wet bulb and relative humidity so you can see that heater is directly above me and it's an infrared gas heater um, what that means is it heats objects so it is measuring in here. Now, even my moisture from my breath will raise it. It started out at 17% relative humidity. Um, it's up to 19. And if I just breathe on it, it jumped to 24. So obviously you wanna just sit this down and walk away and let it take its readings. Relative humidity in a home in the mid-Atlantic is very difficult to get it above, particularly in January and February for forced hot air heat, to get it into that 35 to 50 range. It's very difficult. In my own house, I cannot get it above 35%. I have forced hot air heat. I have one of the best humidification systems I could find, and it's steam-generated moisture. It comes on. It's got calibration set for outdoor relative humidity and outdoor temperatures. I mean, it is, and I still have a very low relative humidity in my house, but it's better than what it was, which what it was was 15%. The desert has more moisture than that. You know, the desert can have 18% relative humidity in it. So that gives static electricity, it uh, dust balls, I mean, things just start shrinking. So every job site, measure relative humidity, measure moisture content, and these are the tools. So this is just one um, option for a thermal hygrometer. I will unbox the, a brand new one of these, but this is the HT3000 from Delmhorst. Uh, this unit runs uh, closer to $300. Um, again, and these get all of these get calibrated. Again, we'll, we'll talk about that. But the bulb units are very accurate. I mean, you saw that relative humidity change just when I blew on it. Um, they're very precise. They're very accurate. So knowing the relative humidity is key. Knowing the temperature is key, and then moisture content. Those are all ideal measurements that we need to talk about things like shrinkage and I mean, if you look at the hickory table sitting in front of me right here um, this has tongue oil on it uh, I probably built this a year ago maybe and it was drum tight but that infrared heater behind me beats on this every day in the winter and probably sapped all the moisture out of it it shrunk now in the summer, spring and summer, this will grow and these will get tight, but these cracks are there 
you know, it's a perfect example. You know, hickory moves a lot. It has um, dimensional stability of hickory is not great. Uh, it's this five inch plank hickory, it's plain sawn. Um, so it moves, it's, uh, it's actually select grade. So these are the things we're talking about. Um, so moisture content, let's measure moisture content. Um, thermo hygrometer I'm gonna put away. Uh, I will take out the um, hygrometer from Delmhorst. Those are the two companies that we deal with with regard to um, equipment for relative humidity temperature and moisture content would be uh, Wagner meters and um, Delmhorst. And there, there are a lot of companies out there uh, that make equipment to measure relative humidity and moisture content. But let's do the HT3000. All of Delmhorst's uh, meters come with a carrying kit. This is great because these actually, these instruments, they're precision instruments. Um, they need to be calibrated. Uh, they, they're specific, they have a specific job. It has injection blown mold kit that fits this unit. Um, you can see we carry ours, um, aside from the messy papers, but we keep them in a padded case. Uh, they are precision instruments. They're not, uh, they're not cheap and we do calibrate them. Uh, this is a calibration block that we use for the pin meter. And all of these units, um, I would say probably six to eight months, get sent out, recalibrated at the factory and sent back. Um, they have nominal fees for that. But again, um, if you're just a sand and finish crew, things like this are good to have, even if you're measuring whether finish is dry. You know, if, if you, coat a floor, if you measured it before you started and it was 8% and you measured it two hours later and it was 11%, it's still wet. Um, you know, if it's back to 8% in four hours, you can coat it. It's, you know, that even if you're a sand and finish crew, um, installation companies, you definitely need these materials. So this is a uh, HT 3000 and this is a dumb horse unit. Um, we have a power on, power off. We have temperature up and down, and we can change from Fahrenheit to Celsius. And again, this will also measure um, relative humidity. And you can see it's reading about 21%. And it's pretty instant. Um, I usually, if I'm at a job site, just kind of wave it around, get it started, and then I'll leave it about three, four feet off, maybe on a coffee table or like right in the middle of the couch. Um, I try not to put them on anything where it's gonna fall over. So it's not breaking. The other unit read like 20%, this is reading 21%, plus or minus, we're, you know, we're spot on. So we know that this battery is good. These do have battery checks. Um, hold down two buttons for three seconds and a certain number will come up. It's all in the manual. Um, you can check the battery, make sure, that's the first, if you're having a faulty reading, the first thing to do is to check the battery, make sure you, know, you have a good battery. All the units come with batteries for, for every one of these, um, but that does not mean that the battery won't be low or bad. It could, you know, if it's sitting on the shelf for three months, it might not be in great shape, so you may have to change the battery when you get it. All right. So that's the hygrometer. Um, these units are all serialized, so we record the serial numbers just like we would any other equipment that goes out. Um, again, very um, accurate, expensive equipment. Um, so you want to take care of it. It's good that it's in a case. I'm just going to put this away. Actually, no, I'm going to keep it out. I'm going to talk about this. So uh, moisture meter, moisture content readings, MC, percent moisture content. I have two here in front of me, um, technically three when we count this um, 26 EC unit. But so the J2000, 
is a pin type meter from uh, Delmhorst and we've used this meter and have had it for uh, for years um, it's a very reliable um, a very accurate unit the battery is uh, separated out and I'm going to turn to our unit but it has case to cover the pins and then it has an accessory port um, the accessory port which I'm going to grab our unit now So, accessory port. What's the accessory port for? Um, if you are testing moisture and uh, you have an accessory that you need, like a 26 EC, um, these pins on this unit, these 3 8 pins, are not insulated. Insulated pins look like that they have a coating on them and then the tip between those two is where it's measured that is uninsulated and that's where the reading comes from so where would you use uninsulated pins if you need to drive through the floor into the subfloor this is the unit um, this is a slap hammer this will punch these inch and an eighth pins down through the hardwood floor or engineered floor and into the subfloor and if it's engineered flooring it'll go through the subfloor and into the joist um, if you know where the joist is. What, why is that important? If you don't have access to the joists underneath because the, fin the basement is finished or there's a ceiling in the um, downstairs living room and you're measuring the upstairs bedroom and you don't have access to that, that's where this would come into play. Um, you can measure uh, joists in the basement, you can measure beams, and that, that will give you readings to let you know what's happening, why is there moisture in the beams. Um, you'll see a lot of these at mills. We don't use these very often, mostly for inspection, that kind of thing, uh, but they are, it's a great tool, and this lead ties into that accessory right there. Um, you do need to set the unit up uh, to read a code, and the instructions are in the manual for that, but you do need to set this unit up so that it's not reading uninsulated pins, and it's reading insulated pins. There are two different codes in here for that. So um, that's really the only accessory that we go through. Um, the pins are replaceable. You will break these for sure if you're using this enough. You're just going to break them. They're, they're going to get snapped off in the wood. Uh, we have the retaining collars and the pins. Uh, we have the insulated pins. So we keep pretty good stock for, and you know, it's like anything, any tool that you sell, you want access to the accessories. So um, real quick, we are talking about a pin meter. So the, the moisture content that this is measuring is between these two. Whereas an electromagnetic pinless unit, it's a larger surface area. So all we're doing is measuring a current resistance between these two pins. Um, but in order to do that, we need to know the species of the wood. And that can be tricky sometimes, but there are charts inside All the manuals uh, that goes for both Wagner and Delmhorst and I'll just show you a quick species chart and that number there and these are just the most uh, common species we do have a collection of other ones, well, this is not in this kit, but 
we have a spreadsheet that we print up for bamboo, all kinds of you know exotics from Africa, South America, Central America, you name it. Um, and you can always call the 800 number on these manuals to get the number that you would dial in. And it's very simple. Um, so we're gonna turn this unit on. Uh, we have a tree here that represents the wood species. We have a temperature which is measured by, or has a thermometer on here to tell you the temperature. And then obviously the water droplets measure, this is what you're gonna press when you have the pins inserted into the wood. And um, this is a check for the meter. So Delmhorst has, you press both of these. If it reads 12, this meter is calibrated. Um, if it didn't read 12, the first thing I would do is change the battery. Um, so I know that this unit is working. Um, I'm just gonna put in the species. I've got several here. I've got um, maple, I've got red oak, I've got white oak. I have an engineered board here that is about one or two mils of hickory. Uh, and then I have hickory, solid hickory, on the um, disassembly inspection table in the shop here. So we will measure these up. So for the oak um, and, and the pin meter, the pin meter is going to leave pin holes in the floor. Um, if it's a dark floor and you can do it in a corner, great. Um, obviously, if you're measuring wood that's been dropped off at a job site, you're going to select um, various bundles measure on the bottom it's not a problem right because that's hidden but when it's installed and you're measuring it and you measure it from the top just know it is going to leave holes and I'm going to show you that here so we're going to dial in the species um, red oak is 31 and what does that mean that means that this meter when I set this to 31 it's reading the specific gravity of red oak. And the Forest, Forest Timber Association has set the specific gravity for all of these species, um, particularly the domestic ones, hickory, uh, red oak, white oak, maple, um, cherry, walnut, ash, uh, sassafras, you know, all of them. They all have their own specific gravity. And that's really important to know because that also relates to dimensional stability. So I'm gonna dial in 31. That's telling the meter that we're gonna use the specific gravity for red oak. And then this is, yeah, it's got, it has stain on it and actually has a coat of finish on it, but I know it's red oak. Um, so I'm gonna go with the grain and I'm gonna measure the moisture content. Now I'll just preface this. This piece of wood has been sitting out at the counter for about weeks. Same situation under a infrared gas heater. So it's gonna be pretty dry. Um, I bet this will probably dial in around six to six and a half percent, but we'll see. Um, so you definitely wanna bury the pins into the wood. Oh, it made a liar out of me. It's uh, 8%, or 72 so it's dropping. So, yeah, we're right around 6, so it was dropping. So it's going to be 6 and a half, 6, 6 and a half percent. Um, and you can see what it did. I mean, it, again, it's, um, it's a pin. This is a white stained floor with water base on it. So it shows the mark. Um, I have white oak here and the white oak code 32. So I'm going to dial that in. Oh, you know what? I didn't dial that in, did I? Let's do that again. So red oak was 31. Maybe that's why the reading is wrong. Nah, it's gonna get down. Yeah, so it's right around six percent. So 
<coughs> contacts are tight. So I'm going to dial in um, white oak, which is 32. Uh, my temperature here is I'm, I'm putting it in at 70, and I do that by just it's already set at 70, um, just hitting the temperature. If I had to dial that in, I would just hold it and it will increase in multiples of five. And I believe it'll go all the way up to two something and then flip back to, yeah. So back to 70. And just my species is at 32, so that's white oak. So then I go ahead and measure. I'm at 6.4. Again, this piece has been sitting out at the counter. And we're right around 6. Um, I know that this end of the board, I uh, before I got here, this half I ran under the uh, faucet so that I could get it wet. Um, because I want you to see the difference when we use electromagnetic pinless versus the pin and see if we pick up any of that surface moisture. but And we shouldn't because it should measure below it and then come back up to the unit. So, um, pin versus pinless. And now we, we'll do the um, pinless now. So uh, if we have any questions on these pin meters, you can let me know, um, it's no problem. So this is the um, MMC 220 from Wagner, and I'd say for pinless ones, this is probably our most popular model. Uh, so if you could see it on the back here, this is actually the area from here to here. I guess it's about two and a half inches by an inch and a half. That is the reading area for the electromagnetic cur magnetic current. Um, the battery is here. Um, and this unit was, the battery was dead. So I replaced this battery because I got an error code on the front that said battery, low battery. So it wasn't dead, but um, I replaced it. Uh, very similar operation on off button and species correction button so uh, unlike the Delmhorst when we dial in a species number on this one it is the specific gravity of the species so if I dial in 63 it's 63 is the specific gravity for red oak um, and they're all pretty close some of them are way high some of them are low um, but when it, when you do put the species in uh, it's not 0.48 with the specific gravity would be. It actually just says 48 doesn't have the decimal. Um, so the idea for this is <clears throat> this is going to measure. Um, we have so many of these meters. Um, this is going to measure three quarters of an inch to about two to two and a half inches. Um, and Oh, moisture content range, that's important. So you're gonna range in moisture content from 5% to about 30% with this. So if the wood is above 30%, walk away. No, I'm just kidding. Um, if it's above 30%, you'll probably get an error reading on this. And, this, and the Delm Horse, the J2000, I think is 6% and the peak might be 40. I think it is 40. So if it's below 6%, you might not get a reading at all. Um, so that's, or it might be a minus sign, I think. I forget, but anyhow, the range is 6% to 40, and this one is 
5% to 30, somewhere in there. Those specifics are definitely in these books. Um, so all I'm gonna do is turn it on, but the important thing to know about this guy is it's three quarters. So what do you do if you have engineered and you don't have a solid floor, which is three quarter? Um, the book will tell you that this, if it's less than three quarters of an inch, which this engineered is, you wanna have it elevated by at least an inch and an airspace of at least an inch between the bottom and the the next surface. So kind of gets a little tricky. Um, I would say that a lot of meters when you get into engineered flooring, um, for instance, the pin meter, you know, the pin meter can measure the resistance between, you know, an engineer floor has four millimeter, five millimeter wear layer. You might be able to get the resistance between that top. Um, some of them say bury it and read the resistance inside the core. And then you need to put in that core's resistance code. So if that plywood is made up of spruce pine and fir, which is SPF, there's a code for that and that's for the Delmhorst J2000. So you really do need to refer to the manual according to how to read engineered products. Um, I know that this one does three quarter to up to about two inches, maybe two and a half in thickness. And um, if you're gonna go thinner, you need an airspace created so that you can read that. Um, again, I would probably call Wagner, um, you could contact us. We could do that for you and get more information on that. But just know that that poses a little bit of an issue. Um, so pinless, um, I'm gonna set this up so that it reads um, species. And I do wanna show you this, where, where the Delmhorst is um, generic in its red oak and white oak, and even its maple. Um, you can have hard and soft maple. Uh, Wagner goes into the specific um, subsets of uh, species, meaning if it's maple, is it silver maple, is it sugar maple, is it red maple? Um, those are a lot, there's a lot of codes for that. So the same with uh, white oak and red oak. And I just wanted to look up um, for instance, hickory, if I want to measure this hickory floor, uh, I have hickory, which uh, they have classified as pecan or bitter nut. They have nutmeg, which is also in the hickory family of pecan. Um, mocker nut, pig nut, shag bark, shag bark shell bark. Um, so there's a whole range of hickories and the specific gravity for these guys goes from 66 to 72. So, that's a high um, specific gravity number, which actually will show you that it's a little bit dimensionally unstable, um, meaning high moisture, low moisture is gonna really make it, it move. Um, so for oak, we have two pieces of red oak and white oak in front of us here. And for red oak, I need to know whether it's black, cherry bark, laurel, northern red, pin oak, scarlet, or southern red, or water. I could tell you what oak that is. That is red oak. I mean, I could tell you it's red oak, but I can't tell you what species of red oak that is. So um, what you do with those specific gravity readings, I don't know if you go with 61 or if you go with 63. So I was gonna put it at 63, but I will tell you, whichever specific gravity you use for your species, write it down and keep those numbers stored because they can be converted if you ever have to find out what red oak species you have. So they can be adjusted. Um, 
and they even do that for some species that they know there's a multiplier when they don't have a specific gravity to put in any of their meters there's a multiplier so for ebony true ebony out of Africa there might not be a code for it but they have a multiplier or they have a setting they want you to use and then once you get the reading they may want you to divide it by something or you know they have they have a way around it um, and again these companies are really good about getting back to you I mean that is their business uh, measuring moisture is what they do so I'm gonna dial in uh, red oak and I'm just gonna pick one that's right in the middle here these these vary from 61 to 68 so I'll just pick 63 which is just northern red oak um, I know that this piece is from Wisconsin so I'm just gonna guess that it's northern red oak um, the mill that it came from so it's Acer uh, so we're gonna dial that in turn it on with the on button uh, wait for it to clear it's going through a check and then I'm gonna dial in the species it is at 63 and then what they want you to do is set it on there just give it about three pounds of pressure and that's reading 6.3 percent so the pin meter was at six this is at 6.3 you know if you're in a in a shrinkage situation or in a cupping situation where floors expand because it's real it's got a lot of moisture is point two and point three going to make a difference no you just want to know where it's at and what range it's in because if it's at 12 there's a problem if it's at five or it doesn't register there's a problem so you know the, that meter will do that um, you can even do that for concrete you know and, and this is just we're gonna get into concrete but if you were to put this regardless of what you dialed in and just kind of put it on the on the ground and said hey it reads 10 it means nothing it doesn't mean that it's 10 percent moisture content all it means is that you got a reading of that area that concrete was 10 if you moved it over towards the outside of the door and it read 15 all that's telling you is that area is wetter than that area that's it it doesn't tell you that it's 15 percent it's just a range to tell you that that area has more moisture in it than that one if you go to another area and it says eight percent that area is drier than the other two and that's it um, we will get into very specific moisture measurements in concrete and tools to do that so um, you can see that this is this is a great tool we'll dial in the species we'll just call this one um, there's a maple one in here and I, I don't want to bore you guys to death but we'll just call it um, sugar maple it's the winter we'll be tapping trees for syrup soon so 63 we'll dial in 60 oh it's already at 63 so specific gravity of 63 and we're at 6.6 percent 6.5 percent um i'm going to go to oak and see if that floor that i put underneath the spigot for a little bit is is white oak and i'll just use the middle number at 64 66 why don't we go to 66 and we'll dial that in 66 is our specific gravity again I don't know what kind of white oak this is so I would just write that down press it again and I'm at 8% now I measured that before and it was 6 with the pin meter and that end of the board is 8.6%. So this area, I did put this underwater um, and then I did not do anything to this area and it did show that it was drier on this side than it was on this side. Um, just so we'd have some variation. Uh, we'll do the hickory here and uh, I don't know what type of hickory this is, but I can say that why don't we just say it's shag bark hickory it's a cool looking tree in the woods and uh, it's 72 is the species number so 
So we're measuring 6%, and I'm not surprised by that. Uh, it's probably below that, actually. Again, I think we're, we're in that 5 to 6% range with this meter on what the low end is, and you can see the gaps. So I'm, I'm not surprised that this is, is as dry as it is because of that heater right above me. Um, but we're in the wood flooring business and we know that stuff. So we know Hickory's gonna move. Um, anybody have any questions or anything on pinless versus pin or uh, hygrometers? Nope, okay. We're gonna go to concrete moisture testing. And um, so for concrete, we also use um, the Wagner units. And Wagner, the process that, or the ASTM, uh, 2170, somebody will quote me if I'm wrong there. Um, I think it's 2170. And that is known as the in situ. ASTM, oh man, 2170, I don't know what the number is. So the, the differentiation here, this is a relative humidity test. This measures relative humidity in a concrete slab. Um, there are other units out there that measure, and I have their calcium chloride tests, and that is ASTM 1869. So ASTM 1869 is uh, calcium chloride. Uh, CH chloride. Um, calcium chloride. Anybody that's ever done one of those calcium chloride tests, this could give you uh, false negatives and the reason that this one has been adopted and is pretty much standard now um, calcium chloride was you had calcium chloride crystals in a petri dish and you would set that over concrete that isn't coated it was bare concrete in the f on the you know the obviously the concrete floor that you wanted to work on or do work in whether or not you were putting tile coating it with epoxy, sealing it, or putting a wood floor over top of it. Um, you had to test it, and I think they were good for a thousand square feet, each little kit. And so you take these um, calcium chloride crystals that are in a Petri dish, and they have a lid on it. You put that aside, and you get the area prepped, and it had a dome that you would put over top of these crystals. You undo the crystals, take the lid off the Petri dish, put it on the bottom, put it in the dome, and set the dome. The dome had a sealant on it, very similar to like a car windshield would get set into a car. And you would put that dome over top of the calcium chloride crystals. Before you did all of that, you weighed the crystals in the Petri dish. You let it sit for 72 hours, undo the dome, cap the crystals, send it off for a weight. They would do a conversion and come back with a potential um, uh, water emissions rate and because the crystals would take on moisture again it, it was um, it was an ASTM test but it didn't really because it had false negatives meaning you could say hey there, it's below four pounds and you know this thousand feet and we're good to go um, that sometimes wasn't the case so the ASTM 2170, I would say most glue manufacturers, most wood floor manufacturers and mills are going with this guy. And it's, it's known as the in situ test. So what is in situ? In situ is we're taking a concrete slab. And we're gonna drill into the slab so that uh, I believe Wagner's, again, I'm just briefly going over this. Uh, there are whole classes on this. Um, 
once you understand how to do this work, people will hire you and you will purchase these kits to do this stuff. It, it can pay for itself. So, but 40%, uh, 40%, you drill down 40% the thickness of the slab. So how do you find out what the thickness of the slab is? That one's on you. Um, sometimes you can see it from the outside. Uh, if there's a footer and the difference between the concrete slab, it really just depends. But you're going to drill down 40%. So let's just say that this is our 50% mark, and that's our 40% mark. So I'm going to drill down here, and my drill is going to create a nice little cup there. So I've drilled that down. Um, I vacuumed that out. There is a kit, and it's actually our... Uh, sports floor special for the month. Um, these kits are uh, pressurized just to keep the air out of them. So we have um, probes themselves and all of the Wagner probes come with this NIST um, rating which means they've been certified uh, by private certification company and they have um, serialized numbers on them so everything about this product is traceable for being accurate. Um, you get a vacuum nozzle kit to clean the hole out, a brush to clean that hole out and the drill that will go down to within 40% of the thickness of the slab. Um, I think that's a Hilti uh, connection for a Hilti gun. Somebody can correct me if it's, I I'm pretty sure it's a Hilti gun. Um, and then you have the setting tool. And this setting tool uh, pushes the probe down into the concrete. And the reason that I have that like little meniscus right there, that is the probe is going to come down and sit flat and there's going to be a little air gap in the bottom there and that's really important because the beauty of this test is or this style from Wagner is when it gets to the bottom of that the meter um, it's hard to see this is a hundred pack kit uh, that's a big floor but that's for somebody doing a lot of these tests yeah so this unit is what goes into the concrete. Um, at the bottom of this is, um, is the sensor. And when you sit the reader into it, you get relative humidity for the slab. So why is that important? What happens is when you cover a, f a concrete floor with wood, you have moisture that is down in the bottom. Um, I don't know. Yeah. So you have moisture down here, right? It's real, it's everywhere at the bottom of the slab. Again, concrete takes moisture on and lets it go. As long as the surface is open, this moisture is gonna wick its way up and eventually go into the atmosphere. You have air, ambient airflow all around and it's just gonna take that moisture away. So as it gets up here, it's a lot less because it's able to go somewhere. It's able to escape. If we cap this floor, this concrete with a wood floor, a tile, an epoxy, anything, this moisture has nowhere to go and it starts to build up. And as we build up, we start to affect what's underneath, or what's on top, the underneath of what's on top. And that's adhesive, that's padding, it's just about anything. So, we, the, the concrete is becoming um, saturated with the moisture where it normally was able to go, it now can't go because it's capped. We're trying to predict that. So we want to find out what the relative humidity of the slab is 
so that we can detect how much moisture is in that slab if we're going to cap it. That's why we go down 40% the thickness of the slab, so almost half. When we do that, we get a reading. And you could take that reading, which is the relative humidity reading, and use that information, go to the flooring manufacturer and say, hey, my concrete is, is measuring 80% relative humidity. Look at the box, it says, this flooring is good to 85% relative humidity in the slab. Boom, you're good to go. Um, the ASTM standard for tw uh, 2170 is that these holes to sit for 72 hours. Um, I think I read something earlier this month that that standard is gonna change. And I don't know when it's gonna change, but I think it's gonna go to 24 hours because they said that there was no drastic change from 24 to 72 in this bottom part of this um, drill hole. So um, go ahead and check on that. But that's great news because you get a reading the next day and that's, you know, again, allows you to start the job sooner. These test kits, um, they come in a package of 25, they come in packages of 100, they come in the kit itself to do everything. And there's also, I think, five test, five probes in there. Um, a thousand square feet, it's uh, one test kit, no, correct, correction there. It's three tests for the first 1,000 square feet and then one for every thousand after that. So do the math on that. If you have 3,000 square feet, you need five tests, right? Three for the first thousand and two for the next 2,000. So there, we're not gonna drill the concrete here today. That, that in and of itself would take a whole you know, hour to do. We do have a video on our YouTube channel particularly I think the one for engineered flooring install um, that has that being done in it. Um, and it might be separated out, I'm not really sure, but we can update it and maybe get it to the front of the channel so that people can see it. Um, so really that's it. I do want to go over, and again, there's so much information to this kind of stuff. Um, you know, you talk about acclimation, you know, those are, can be fighting words to people sometimes. Um, the NWFA has a great binder. Um, it has all kinds of good stuff in it. Uh, we use it a lot when we're training new guys. Um, it's, it comes with membership or you can you can buy it with membership I don't I don't really know what the costs and all that are but they do have this one in there and it's called water and wood uh, this thing is great um, it kind of puts everybody on the same page and there is a chart in here it's the moisture map of the US and you should if you want to know two charts you want to know this one for your state and you want to know the magic gold box, which is this one. Um, we get, this is equilibrium moisture content, and you want to know what those are for your area. And when I was saying that wood is really happy in that 30 to 50% uh, relative humidity, I omitted the temperature, and that temperature it wants to be at is livable conditions. Um, you know, anything in that 65 to 70 degree range, we don't want to fry the wood, getting it, you know, the ambient temperature of the room up to 80. Uh, I've just seen that in a condo job. It's everything is separating and floors are cupping and all that stuff. And you don't want it um, too low. Uh, that that also affects, you know, low temperatures will affect it. So you see that a lot in shore houses um, where they close up for the winter and it's 50 degrees. So if you know the relative humidity and the temperature, you can get um, the 
EMC. And Wagner has a great app, and it's the uh, Wood H2O app from Wagner. And everybody that has a smartphone, I would download it. And what that does is it gives you, and I just put on relative humidity here of 35% because that's what my house is at. Um, and I put a temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And the equilibrium moisture content of my house, meaning what, what's gonna, what, where the wood's gonna be the happiest is at 7%. So if this wood was measuring six or, or under 5%, you're gonna see shrinkage. And the reason it's doing that is letting moisture off because it wants to be in uh, like homeostasis with its surroundings. So this is a great app. Um, I would use it, we use it. And, um, and again, go ahead and get uh, moisture or water and wood. And it's a great, it's a great guide. It talks about um, below grade, above grade, uh, dimensional st stability of uh, each species, the most common ones. And this is what we just talked about with the concrete slab, how the moisture is gonna block if you cap it. So it's, it's just a good resource. Um, and they have several, you know, they have problems and cures, some of them to deal with moisture, um, species, all kinds of good stuff. So go ahead and take a look at that. It's just a short NWFA plug, but it's a good resource. It's good to have that, know that chart. Uh, if anybody has any questions, just let me know. Um, otherwise, my poor art is gonna get erased. That's it.